Okay, so uh, today we're very grateful to have uh, Sergey Kowalski here from NYU. He's going to tell us about blue ball and string theory. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's my first talk, in person talk after this whole COVID story. I'm really excited to see people around. <laughs> uh, and uh, and they asked me to give a talk about blue balls. So, uh, and my first inclination would be to give a talk, talk with this title, which is the title of this first paper, which we published as a subject back in 2016. But then I realized that actually around five years ago, when this paper came out, I gave a talk here with exactly this title. So it would be, I don't have any records of this talk, probably it was a blackboard talk. So I don't assume that you guys remember what was there, but still it would be embarrassing to give two talks with the same title uh, in the same place. Uh, so I have a different title, which is the uh, title of this last paper, the latest paper on the subject you wrote. But really the first one is more appropriate. Uh, Anyway, uh, so uh, so the plan of this talk is the following. So I'll start with just describing the ansatz for the spectrum of blue balls, which we uh, suggested in this the first paper in uh, 2016, and I uh, compare it to lattice data uh, the way it was back at the time and the way it is now. And well, this, in my view, this comparison looks good enough. Uh, so I said to spend them some time uh, to explain where this answer is coming from, to spend on the derivation and try to understand it better. Because it's really quite interesting that it works. Uh, and the more, more we think about this answer, the more the more we're surprised that it works. Uh, and so then I'll compare it to, uh, to all the effective strings, and I'll finish with few comments, from a few data and ongoing work where we're trying to explain the story to four dimensions. Uh, okay, let me start with three dimensions. And uh, so this uh, answers for the spectrum in three dimensions is inspired by the following two observations. Uh, uh, so well, this name axionic string, string answers really doesn't make much sense in three dimensions. It refers to four dimensions, but uh, uh, anyway. So the first observation is kind of uh, theory driven. Uh, namely, if you take uh, and I'm got the action for, and you think about it as a theory describing uh, dynamics of an infinitely long string. Uh, then uh, at, at three dimensions, uh, there is there exists integrable quantization of this uh, theory, which is compatible with nonlinearized Poincare target space symmetry. So uh, two dimensions where it's possible, it, uh, there is quantization like that in d equal 26, but also at d equal three, uh, there is uh, quantization like that. And this quantization, well, it does, but it, it leads to a theory of a, a massless, inter integrable theory of a massless free boson with the phase shift of this form. So here S is Mandelstam S, uh, well, which are also known as TT bar deformation of a uh, massless free boson. So that's kind of theoretical uh, input and well, experimental input, which goes here, is that if one looks at the uh, lattice data for like lattice simulations of pure blue theory uh, on the computer, uh, this data provides information about a spectrum of confining strings. Uh, and uh, it doesn't show any signs. So if you think again about long string, so expect to have five well, There's a massless mode, which is a Goldstone bone of trans translationally bro broken, spontaneously broken trans translation symmetry. In general, you may expect to find some extra massive excitation on the bullshit. And in three dimensions, uh, uh, so far, this data didn't show any signs of uh, such excitations. So it does show, however, that this theory is not non integrable. So it cannot be that theory on the First half of the slide, uh, and just to how does the lattice data show that? Sorry, how does it show that it is not integral? Yeah, so this is my ne next slide. Very good. Uh, so, well, this is actually, this is actual data. What's shown here? Uh, so, what one does? One uh, measures the finite volumes. So, one looks at the string which winds around compact circle. So, lattice is always on a compact space. So, key one makes use of that. So, one looks at the 
uh, finite volume spectrum of this theory for the sector where string winds around uh, around the circle. Uh, and what's shown here, uh, these are uh, energy energies of uh, well, there is no ground state energy here. There is also ground state which kind of linearly growing, but uh, it's a bit boring. Uh, so here the excitations energy of first excited states and second excited states, uh, and as a function of uh, radius of the circle of the circle. Uh, and uh, so what's shown here, so this dashed line, that would correspond to energies, finite volume spectrum in, in the integrable theory. Uh, in particular, so these two states, these two family of states, uh, uh, this green and blue, they correspond to two particle and four particle states, two particles with KK momentum equal to two or four, uh, one particle uh, or four particle state where we have two pairs of particles each with KK momentum equal to one. So for integrable theory with E to the A space shift, they would be degenerate. Uh, and they, that's probably the most, uh, the, the breaking of this degeneracy, which one observes here, that's the most clear sign of breaking of this integrability. But when I can also go from, from this finite volume data using uh, uh, TPA-like techniques, one can extract the uh, corresponding phase shift and what it's, it's shown here. So this dashed line uh, would be the E to the S integrable phase shift. Uh, and so here one finds that uh, the phase shift deviates from E to the S value. So that, that shows that. And on the other hand, there is a separate argument. Uh, so that's only E to the S phase shift is compatible with Poincare symmetry, the series integrable. So all other phase shifts are there. Um, this is because Poincare symmetry should be present. They indicate that integrability is broken. So that's another way to see it. So this is uh, how one sees it, the theory. The plots um, seem to suggest that for large radius, something special is happening. Is that sorry? Misleading? What? Well, when R is large, it looks like the here. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like the states become degenerate and the separation becomes integral again. All right. Then that, that becomes yeah. That corresponds to. So first of all, I should say what's shown here is the difference between excited energies and ground state energy. But indeed, uh, at uh, at large radius, uh, that's where uh, Lidenov and Abugot approximation becomes more and more accurate. So that's the statement that at, at low energies, the series is integral. Nabugot, classical Nabugot is integral, and here one is dominated by the, well, I get, well, actually, yeah. So this integrability is due to high dimensional operators in the motion. Right. So, yeah, exactly. So that's why it becomes integral. So, well, this. Two uh, pieces of data, they kind of motivated these answers, which roughly speaking is a statement that 3D confining strings are in some sense in the equivalence class of just Nambugota theory. Uh, and uh, kind of one may ask what, what exactly that means to be in the equivalence class of that theory. So, one statement and kind of one assumption here that there are no, like, really, if one looks at the full S matrix on the whole sheet, that uh, there are no additional massive states. Uh, but I think what I'm going to show later may be thought of as a way to make more precise what we mean by saying that it's in the, in the same equivalence class. So, uh, but uh, that's kind of rough idea, roughly what we are trying to say. Uh, and uh, so, what we tried to do back in 2016, so starting with this somewhat vaguely formulated idea. We uh, started. We try to get a prediction for quantum numbers of now in the of short string strings of blue balls. But well, actually, that's that was kind of trying to make more precise. If if we succeeded doing that, that would perhaps be a different definition of what one means uh, by the uh, being of the same equivalence class. Namely, if one looks at the spectrum of blue balls, one finds kind of the same states, but with deformed masses, perhaps, but the shifted energies, but the same set of states which one finds in the integrable limit. So th that's roughly the idea. Uh, and so when I talk about quantum numbers, they're in 3D, so it's spin. Uh, and now for general non-zero spin, there is also charge conjugation, uh, but uh, otherwise uh, states come into pairs of opposite parity. And for scalars, one can also talk about parity. So this is what I mean by uh, quantum numbers. Uh, and 
let me show you the prediction. I'll show later uh, how how it, how one obtains that prediction. But let me just show the prediction itself. So well, the prediction was that kind of inspired by the uh, how this sector uh, how the spectrum looks in critical string theory. One expects to find states organized by string level. Uh, again, critical string theory. Uh, states on the same level are exactly degenerate, which is related to this degeneracy, which we saw previously in the white and string sector. So here, theory is not integrable, so one doesn't ex expect, expect to find exact degeneracy, but one expects, and the prediction was that one expects to find clusters of states which approximately degenerate, uh, and kind of with these quantum numbers summarized here, and these multiplicities, I'll show you later where it's coming from. Are we supposed to take this seriously for small n? Uh, n is the number of colors there on the left? No, no, so yeah, that's, that's a, uh, no, no, sorry. This, and this is, that's a level, so. Oh. No, this is, this is, re this is really prediction for large yes, right. Okay. And the data which I was showing you, well, which I will show on the next slide for globals, that's already, that's large N from extrapolation. But I should say that if one looks at SU3 spectrum, that it differs for most states, it differs from kind of large N result by maybe 10, 15%. So SU3, at least for, for our purposes, because we're not really trying to calculate masses now, we're just trying to qualitatively des describe the features of the spectrum. SU3 is as good as, as SU infinity. Mm -hmm. SU2 is different because their charge conjugation is not the symmetry one. I think I'm only answered, but uh, SU3 uh, is. So what is n again? N, n is a level of a string. So basically, the prediction is there should be group, groups of states organized labeled by this n, which is not in C, but, but n. The energy of each of these states are roughly equal? Or? Right, yeah, that's kind of the, the qualitative expectation. So in critical string theory, they would be exactly equal. Here, one doesn't expect them to be equal, but expect, expect them to be kind of well, to see pronounced group of states. Mm -hmm. with, the, with these quantum numbers. And this number of state is Fibonacci number square or what, what are these? Yeah, these are squares. These are multiplicities of, at each level. I'll mm -hmm. show later where they're coming from. And this is their spin and like spin contact content of states at, at, the, each, at each level. Mm -hmm. So again, later I explain to you where it came from. That's kind of the main uh, purpose of this talk to describe, to discuss kind of what goes into this uh, sex, uh, into this uh, prediction, but first I want to try to convince you that there is a reason to take it seriously if one just looks at the data. And any more questions? About the part? Yes. So, so the world sheet theory, we're in some three dimensions and some like Linville. What is this non critical string? Well, we, we don't know what it is, but kind of the assumption is that well, it has a single degree of freedom, which is ma this massless boson. Well, it's essentially that's that's this, the SA assumption. So that it's some deformation of, uh, of a massless boson. Uh, well, part of it is kind of this Nabugoto part, but there is also some high dimensional uh, interaction. But that's an underlying assumption that there is not no extra modes. So in particular, there is nothing like extra Liouville mode. Uh, right. Uh, so let me first show. So this is the latest data back in 2016. So when this prediction was made, so that sense, well, the agreement or disagreement with this data shouldn't be considered as success. Well, this agreement should be considered as not success, but agreement shouldn't be considered as a success because that came, that data came, we, we saw this data before making the prediction. Uh, so well, first of all, yeah, I color coded here. So well, these are states which belong to different levels. So one can already see well, that clearly there is no exact degeneracy. Uh, so, for instance, states that so it really helps to separate these uh, states in the spin axis because otherwise levels would be. So on the lattice, they must pick a particular NC, right? What, what NC do they? Yeah, these are this is uh, interpolate. So the, uh, in this paper, they uh, simulated it up to SU sixteen. So that's really large NC extrapolation of that. So these are large NC answers. Right, because it's d equals three, so you can calculate the pretty large NC. Uh, uh, so, so first of all, what clearly sees that it's kind of there's so this states which I group by the same color, this would be states at the same level. So clearly, well, there are splittings, but also there is overall tendency that states with 
uh, larger uh, larger spin have larger energy. That actually nicely fits with uh, what we found before. That uh, fits nicely with this with this slide. So what we observed here, so that compared to the e to the S phase shift, which would lead to exactly the general at the level, there is extra positive addition to the phase shift, me meaning that at high energies, roughly saying the theory is more, the interaction is more attractive than E to the S theory. Uh, now what kind of, uh, what this, these states are, uh, which I'm showing here. So these states, these are states that they're leading energy trajectory. So they correspond to, um, think in terms of string picture, they correspond to just long, rotating rod solution. And uh, so states above the leading energy trajectory, they correspond to adding wiggles on top of that smooth background. So the fact that they have smaller energy than in the theory where there would be exact degeneracy that fits nicely with the statement that there is extra attractive interaction in the theory uh, when you look at the long string excitation as compared to E to the S theory. So that's actually uh, nice. Uh, now, so at the time, uh, well, so the, there was a, the, we, you look at the table on the previous slide, so there is agreement, this is zero plus plus, so it's agreement what they call n equals zero level, n equal one level, and n equal two level, but in that, uh, sorry, zero, one, two, yeah, at n equals three level, there was no, not enough data. Actually, there was a problem there. One, one, one thing which is important to keep in mind that at least these simulations, they, for most states, they were not really making spin determinations. And the problem is that in two dimensions, when you go on a lattice, you break uh, continuous SO2 rotation to Z4, and all states are doublets. So it's, it's hard to tell uh, the actual spin of the state rather than Z4 spin of the state. So when, uh, at the time, people were doing it really on case-by-case -case basis, basically looking at the wave function corresponding to certain state and trying to see whether they look like uh, more like Z4 or, or like well, what spin, what's, what actual spin value they correspond to. And here, the circles, they correspond to the states which were, and for which this kind of determinations has been done. So for instance, for this state, there is those indeed studied in the literature, which uh, said that this is J equal four rather than J equals zero. And for this circle, so there is this one G, J equal one state and three J equal three states. So there was also claimed that it was like that. And if you look at the table, uh, which uh, I showed you oops, before, that actually contradicts to what our prediction was. So our prediction was that there were a pair of, uh, at the third level, there should be a pair of J equal one states and a pair of J equals three states. So actually at the time uh, when this prediction came out, there was kind of already contradiction with existence, existing claims in the literature. Anyway, it worked kind of up to, up to level uh, n equal two. And uh, so there was some tension starting at n equal three. Uh, so uh, what we did with Mike Tepper and Peter Ponke, who is was a PhD student at NYU, and by we, I really mean Peter, uh, uh, under the direction of Mike, and I was just cheerleading, so I'm, I'm not, well, I, I know how to run Mathematica, but my computer skills don't go be, be, be beyond that. Uh, so these guys did a dedicated uh, lattice simulation uh, where the goal was really to determine continuous spins of all states. Well, and the idea is very simple. You cannot do Z4 rotation, but you can kind of build in operators like that you can because you can rotate on the lattice. You can you can exactly rotate things only by uh, uh, pi over two. Uh, but uh, using kind of operators like this, one can construct uh, this operator it implements approximate pi over eight rotation. And so, uh, using these approximately rotated operators, one can construct kind of approximately rotated states and. Uh, to determine uh, actual spin contact of the states, it's quite costly well, because uh, well, for several reasons. So the simulations was only NOC4, but you need pretty large lattice also you know, to, to for this approximate rotation symmetry to really uh, to se well separate the states. Uh, so that's what, what, what was done in the paper. Uh, and so the result, let me show you the result here. Uh, so well, most states were measured. And uh, so first of all, this disagreement went away. So it turned out 
that disagreement. So there is indeed at n equal two levels there are two spin one and two spin three. It was related to some misidentification in some earlier papers. So well, anyway, so that that, 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 that went the way. And well, and it basically it works also for uh, this uh, uh, states, 25 states, which one uh, finds at n equal two level. But well, one may kind of argue a little bit it's at spin zero sector. So well, this, this blue state. So uh, the color coding is that everywhere the state which kind of according to the prediction belongs to the next level. I call it uh, color coded differently. So this state is not that fast separated from these ones, but also well as the approximate degeneracies and as the number of states on the level grows, one expects that the broadening gets gets large. So. Uh, I don't see this as a big problem. Also, actually, for these highly excited states, the uncertainties, I, I, I don't show here uncertainties in the mass determination, they're getting quite large. Uh, but so, apart from here, I think in all other places, but well, whenever basically, whenever one sees a clear gap and one sees it essentially all over the place, uh, the, uh, the spectrum does agree with the prediction uh, we, which we had. Uh, back in 2016, and actually, well, that prediction also says that there, there are 64 states uh, at this uh, what's called correspond to n equal four level. And I didn't show all the higher line states because they are parts getting really large there. But essentially, it, it kind of roughly agrees there. So again, the situation is when everyone sees clear gaps, the the, the, the answer works. So that's like for it gets for j equals zero. There are lots of states there. So there, it's, it's uh, hard to say whether it works or not. But at, uh, at most uh, other spins, uh, it, it seems that it works. So well, at least for me, that looks good enough to now spend some time trying to understand better uh, where this uh, prediction came from. Uh, well, uh, at least it seems to be successfully described at least like 39 low line global states in uh, equal three young means. Question. Yes, so I know very little about these numerical simulations. So, so what are people doing here? They're doing Monte Carlo. They're doing some sort of right. You and try to find the lowest energy eigenstate. Yeah, yeah, you're doing Monte Carlo. You're measuring matrix of two point fun like you measure construct big basis of operators with different quantum numbers, uh, and you uh, measure matrices of two point function, two point for correlation functions, and you just fit them. Uh, is a sum of exponents, decaying exponents, and these exponents they give the masses masses of the states. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yes. Let's look at this. Yeah. Any more questions about the data? Okay. Good. So let me now uh, kind of come back. Uh, so that, that said, it's to me that looks sufficiently good. So now to spend some of your time trying to explain. What we actually did back in 2016 to derive that answer. And I, as I already said, somehow, the more I think about it now, the, the more I'm surprised that it worked. But uh, at the time, we thought that we were doing something very natural. But well, I think part of it is very natural. So well, there are several assumptions which made uh, came uh, in, the, in what we're doing. So, first, we made the following answers for the Hilbert space. Uh, well, it's kind of motivated by. Again, critical strings, but also more broadly, I think it's more or less definition of what you mean by one dimensional object uh, where you have only massless excitations on the ball sheet. So uh, one expects uh, that the full Hilbert space can be written uh, as a sum over levels. Uh, and this level matching condition arises just due to the fact that well, like the shift symmetry in the long, along the ball sheet is a gauge symmetry. Uh, it's the representations in uh, symmetry. So uh, the total momentum along, this, along this, uh, the string should be equal to zero. So one find, uh, one expect to find to find se sectors which, which correspond labeled by total left moving and right moving KK momentum, just like one finds for uh, for critical strings. And that's uh, that was uh, the answer. And in each sector, one finds, but at each level then one uh, expect to find states which are tensor product of left movers and right movers. So here already there is a uh, built-in assumptions that there are no massive excitation on string, right? Because if there are massive additional massive states, then you can add on top of this structure, you can add those massive states with, with zero momentum. So the structure uh, of the Hilbert space will be different. So that's uh, uh, 
uh, enters here. Uh, and the charge conjugation, well, in gauge theory language, it reverts the direction of the Wilson line. Uh, so it ex exchanges uh, left and right components, uh, left, left and right moves on, on, the, on the sector. Actually, already from this very minimalistic assumption, one can already uh, deduce uh, some non-trivial consequences. Oh, of course, for, for this to be useful, one needs to make some assumption about structure of the spectrum. And again, in the critical theory, there is exactly degeneracy at each level. And so here, there is an assumption that states are kind of ordered by the KK number N, and there is approximate degeneracy. Otherwise, yeah, that wouldn't be useful. Uh, but with this very broad assumptions, one already can uh, say something. Uh, namely, one can uh, write this uh, in a multiplication table for O2 group, which uh, 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 in the three dimensions, which is relevant for, for three dimensions. And well, so these are kind of, if one takes this, this tensor product, these are uh, the things uh, which one may find. Well, of course, zero zero assumption that's what Sean, I think, asked me already. So, yeah, this level one expects to find multiplicities which are equal to square of integer numbers. Uh, but also, for instance, this uh, statement about that we have we had a prediction about that there should be two spin one state and two spin three state it just comes from this line so if you look at this uh, this table so the only place where you can get odd spin states that's the last line here and you get them you always get pairs of states so when should to get odd spin state you need to take different j1 and j2 into in left and right components and that you get pairs of state with opposite separity here uh, so that's really very model independent, I would argue, assumption. If you really, if you believe that uh, string globals look, look like, well, the globals are strings, that's, it's very hard to get around this assumption, but without additional massive states. Perhaps one can do something with them. This here, it's very hard uh, to, to do anything about that. Uh, so, so that's already quite restrictive. Uh, but then we to get actual numbers, actual predictions for the spins uh, and uh, quantum numbers, other quantum numbers. So we went further, and we went the, we did the following uh, semi-classical calculation, which was largely inspired by again, but what one finds in critical string theory. So in critical string theory, we know that this left moving and uh, right moving sector that's the same as Hilbert space of open strings. And so for open strings, what, uh, what one can do, one can start at large J, one can find this state which corresponds to leading ratchet trajectory, which is this uh, classical uh, rotating road solution. Uh, and then uh, let's now quantize that consider at large J, this is a good semi-classical background. So one may consider perturbations around this background and quantize theory perturbatively uh, around this solution and uh, kind of a, uh, Work in large J uh, perturbation theory. And so let, let me uh, go in a bit more detail through this calculation because uh, there are some non uh, uh, things there. Uh, so, although many of what I'm going to say will be very familiar. So, first of all, one starts, well, the action one starts is with this, this uh, Polyakov Polchinski Strominger action. So, well, this familiar Polyakov action, but we work in, in D equals three. So the theory uh, is, uh, is non-critical. Uh, so the way to deal with this is to add this term, which uh, uh, well, it's basically that term is meant to restore. It's, it's the term is meant to restore wide invariance without introducing uh, explicitly Liouville field. So it's uh, it roughly it's d log phi squared, where phi is a composite object, phi is uh, dx squared. So one, one writes uh, a composite operator like that, which is singular if one expands around trivial vacuum x equal to zero. But here we're doing expansion around long string. So around long string, uh, the, this kind of operator uh, uh, can be, it looks perfectly local uh, and it's efficiently fixed by requiring that the full series that uh, the wild symmetry is restored. Uh, so this is a starting point. Uh, but then for, for our purposes, because we what we're really after, we're just looking at the three level spectrum of perturbations. So actually we never use this part. So these dots stand for 
possible other higher dimensional operators which one may write in this effective field theory. So in the calculation we're using, we, we, we really uh, drop the, these terms. Uh, so we just really work in the, the classical uh, product of action. Uh, then, uh, well, it turns out to be useful for these purposes to use first order first order formalism. So one uh, reformulates it like this here, pi is kind of can canonical momentum conjugate to, uh, to axis. And the advantage of this formalism that it makes uh, the structure of the uh, canonical structure of the theory very manifest. So there is a just canonical symplectic form, and there are two two Verasoro constraints, and that this metric uh, combination say plays the role of uh, Lagrange multipliers. Uh, and so what one does then one uh, we fixed this gauge, so it's kind of analog of static gauge, which is convenient when quantizing around this uh, long uh, rotator rod. So you fix x0 uh, star, tau, why not? Uh, becomes this quantity. So this E of tau on shell is a constant equal to the space time energy uh, of the string. And then as a consequence of x0 and pi0 equations, uh, then they fix also metric to be eta alpha beta. So in general, uh, and this first order formalism is a way to do the same thing as you do in light cone gauge, but kind of without doing this extra gauge fixing on shell uh, in some sense. But here it's also convenient for some other purposes. But uh, so after one does, one does this, one, one, one is left with x's and pi's. So uh, they have this uh, well, usual uh, expansion of that. There's a set of oscillators, but on top of that, well, there are zero modes. Uh, but also, I separated the space. Uh, this kind of it's a goldstone mold associated with rotations uh, in, the, in the plane. And there are various sort of constraints, which after gauge fixing, we will done gauge fixing, they can be just solved uh, and uh, to get the physical uh, uh, phase space of the theory. So after doing that, one arrives at the physical phase space with the full following variable. So there is a X and P, like the Average positions of the strings. There is uh, angular. Uh, this is internal angular momentum and the conjugate variable, which is space, which I had before. And there is a tower of uh, oscillators. So, uh, so here, uh, this axis. These were. Oops. So uh, these were these are complex uh, combinations. So these are complex oscillators. But as a result of solving the sort constraint, one is left with a single real oscillator. In terms of this uh, quantities, the Volchek Hamiltonian takes this form, and one gets this uh, mass shell condition, well, which is quite familiar, uh, which uh, takes this form. Uh, and uh, J is a, it's a momentum, it's a variable which is uh, uh, canonically conjugate to uh, this Goldstone mode delta, which has two pi periodicity. So uh, J should be integer quantized. Well, actually, all of this is somewhat non trivial, although it looks like uh, something very familiar uh, in the complete reality. Uh, however, well, people, what people did also in the past, they applied light cone quantization to D equals three strings. So, usually, light cone quantization in non critical dimension and conventional light cone quantization, not around this rotating background, it's anomalous. But in three, three dimensions, the anomalous commutator. So it's kind of it's G plus I, G plus J commutator, but in three dimensions, it vanishes. So it gives an impression that maybe also in three dimensions, like cone quantization gives rise to, uh, to consistent theory. Uh, but what these guys found that if you do that, and then you actually look at the helicity spectrum of the theory, then you necessarily find irrational anions in, in the spectrum, which really for me, looks like something like a global anomaly because uh, you, you started with a theory which is invariant under just Poincare group. And as a result of quantization, you found this rational anion. So you changed the symmetry uh, group of the theory on, on the way. So it's story, it sort of seems to, it's similar to what happens in gauge theories. Like when you SVN series, there is a chiral anomaly in local co 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 uh, correlators. But when you go SU2, you only get global anomaly. So it's kind of the same thing happens here, like on quantization. In high dimensions, produces directly anomaly in the commutator commutators of the algebra generators, but 
it's still anomalous quantization also in B equals three, but this perturbative quantization around long string, it doesn't suffer from this problem. It uh, knows about the correct quantization of the momentum. Uh, and so, and on top of that one gets uh, the tower of excited states. And uh, it's important here, it starts the, the, the one, the lowest oscillator is missing because the lowest oscillator is kind of, it's a Goldstone mode, which moves one along the rigid trajectory. So that's what isn't. Uh, so if you look uh, at the spectrum uh, of, of this, the zeros, the first level. So what I've shown here that at each J, I just showed this spectrum of excitation. So it's the same column in this table. Uh, and, uh, and actually, well, that can be compared with uh, what one gets from slightly different light cone quantization. Namely, if you take light cone quantization in higher dimensions and analytically continue the helicity, helicity spectrum at d equals three. So that would be a similar table which you get this way. And the uh, red entries show where the two quantization agree. So they agree in the vicinity of the uh, leading rigid trajectory as it should, because then that's where effective field theory uh, is expected to work. But for sufficiently uh, large excitations, these two quantizations, they predict, uh, predict uh, different uh, multiplicities. And so uh, what we did back in 2016 is something very brave, uh, something very bold, well, maybe very stupid, but it seems to work. So we basically said, okay, let's take this semi-classical answer, which we obtained in light J limit, and let's let's take it literally for open strings. So let's literally take this, this table and let's put it into the tensor square and see what, what the resulting spectrum of closed strings is. And that's, uh, that's the spectrum which I was showing you before. So that's kind of all right <coughs> in, in, in this table. And which kind of somewhat surprisingly seems to be working uh, well with large subset of, of, of global states. Uh, so, so are there any questions about kind of that all the parts of the story? Square of some number, which is the degeneracy of the open string. Well, it's not just the, the number, but we really because we have at level by level, so we have a content, right? So we, we if you look, uh, well, which one? This one, right? So if you you look at this table, so if you look at each level, so these numbers tell us uh, multiplicities of uh, of the states which we have. Uh, for these different spins. And then we uh, just take this, uh, uh, this, uh, this content and plug essentially in, in this table. Uh, so the charge, so, so what it, it, it leaves unfixed. So here there is parity assignment for, 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 for the states and that we, 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 we're not imposing it. So it leaves some ambiguity for parity predictions for some scalars. But to get ambiguity, you need to get to situation when there are at least two scalars in the open sector at the same level. And that doesn't happen until I think n equals five. So, uh, but apart from that, it fixes. So for most of the states, it fixes all C charge predictions, it fixes all spins. So that, 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 that's, so yeah, so there, there will be kind of uh, starting from uh, somewhere here, I think. Uh, there will be ambiguities. Yeah, I don't remember, but I, I think for five or equal four, there will be a couple of uh, states, spin zero states for which we don't have prediction for parity assignment. But module of that, everything, all the rest is fixed, fixed by this uh, procedure. Uh, so, okay, so the, uh, well, that looks like a success to me. So, well, then the next question was, it looks like, well, can we, Calculate splittings perturbatively. So we think we understand where the state's coming from. So can we calculate some of the splittings or this inclination of the level uh, developing some kind of perturbation theory? Uh, and but the natural idea is again to try to do this uh, perturbatively expanding uh, around rotating road solution, but it's not clear how to do it. 
consistently using this procedure which I described for you, right? So it was a bit indirect. We started with open string spectrum, constructed, constructed rotating road solution there, and tensor squared the whole thing. So that's, I'm not sure how to now consistently do perturbative calculation for the mass corrections in that frameworks. Uh, but what one can do, one can do something more straightforward. Uh, namely, one can start uh, directly with rotating rod solution for closed rotating rod, which again should be a good approximation for leading rigid trajectory of closed strings, and just quantize small perturbations around that. And to be honest, when we were writing the 2016 paper, I kind of been back on my mind, I thought that this procedure will actually produce the same spectrum as uh, we've got by tensor square and uh, spin, spin zero, but we, we kind of, we, well, there, there are some historical reasons why we did it the way we did. Uh, we were kind of lucky because as you will see now, actually this, this procedure gives different answer for highly excited state. So that's, uh, but still, uh, if one, I think at the moment, if one wants to go ahead and calculate the splittings, it seems to me that's the only way to go, which I'm aware of at the moment, uh, but we'll see there's something interesting happens here. So let's let's try to do this. Let, let's try to start with a closed rotating road solution and perturbatively quantized per, uh, around that solution at large J. And uh, I don't want to go through again through the algebra, but let me just, Kind of, this is a summary of what happened for open strings. This is like short summary of the calculation which I showed for you. Uh, so there, after fixing the static gauge, one left with this complex field X, which is X1 plus IX2, which have a bunch of complex oscillators. Then there is uh, this uh, N equal one sector, which contains Goldstone mode. Uh, and then there are sort of constraints. They remove half of the oscillators. They leave one with a real oscillator. And also they remove uh, this delta rho mode, that's kind of the mode which is being eaten uh, uh, because of spontaneous breaking of the rotation symmetry. Uh, and so on. And then in addition, as I said, delta is a periodic variable. So the canonically conjugate variable, which is a uh, angular momentum takes integer, integer values. And so at each fixed J, then one gets a tower of n larger than one oscillators coming from here. So that's for the story for open strings. So what is the story for closed strings? It's pretty, it's pretty similar. Well, there is a kind of as is well familiar. There is essentially a doubling of everything. You have two towers of complex oscillators. You have more modes in n equal one sector. Uh, so you have Verasor constraints, but also there is additional residual symmetry because uh, now you have a periodic string. So the shift of sigma by constant is allowed is, is a gauge symmetry unlike for open strings. So there is this residual gauge symmetry and that uh, residual gauge symmetry, it removes now in the n equal one sector, it removes again this radial mode, but also it relate, removes second mode, which is there. Whereas our constraints, similarly, they out of two towers of harmonic oscillators, they uh, two complex towers of harmonic oscillators, they give two real towers of harmonic oscillators. Delta is a periodic variable, J, J is quantized. Uh, so far, it's all the same. Uh, so in addition, uh, it's very important that even after we removed this uh, part of the shift symmetry, there is still shift by sigma going by sigma plus pi, which doesn't affect this delta rho and B. It really, it's kind of essentially, it shifts delta by pi and it's equivalent to, so there is a Z2 transformation which it's equivalent to multiplying this post oscillator uh, coefficients by minus one to the n, where n is the number. So that's still that's residual gauge symmetry which is present here. So one also needs to project states which are charged under under this uh, under this uh, Z two transformation, and that which states uh, get projected away depends uh, whether the state has even j or odd j because uh, that also. Uh, sensitive to the transformation of state under the Z2, it's sensitive to, 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 to the spin. So after one uh, does all of this, so one gets kind of the closed string level, one gets this result. So again, this is similar table which I shown before. And what, show, what I show here is the following. So the red region is where this spectrum agrees uh, with the uh, spectrum which we got in the ISA procedure. Where we did quantization of open strings and then tensor squared. Uh, so, as expected, 
it agrees in the region close to sufficiently close to uh, linear energy trajectory. Uh, but if one goes to highly excited states, uh, so if taking literally that closed string effective spectrum and extending it all the way to j equal to zero would be wrong. Uh, and actually, it would over predict states. So if one sees them, they can do these entries which one has here. So for instance, this is absorbed spectrum. Uh, so here, uh, and which agrees with the previous procedure. So for n equal zero, n equal to one, they, they're the same. Uh, but here, at, already at n equal two, uh, this uh, closed effective string procedure, it would predict uh, odd spin states uh, to appear here, two of them, and it would predict uh, five j equals zero states in, instead of uh, three spin, spin equals zero states. So clearly, well, this procedure much it doesn't match the absorbed spectrum as nicely as the previous one. I think also it's kind of good to have this example because it illustrates well that not kind of not everything goes. So when I'm saying that uh, uh, the spectrum agrees with what we did initially, but well, there is really some content in it. So clearly, it's easy to get something which looks which looks differently. But I'm, I'm confused. What I thought the closed string starting point was the more correct one. What, why does the answer agree with the open string? Well, story? that's that's part of the that's, that's a surprise. Yeah. Well, it's correct. Well, it's correct close to linear energy trajectory. It's where that is guaranteed to work. But nobody said that effective string theory answer should work at high, highly for highly excited states, and it doesn't work. So on its own, it's not it's not a big surprise. And actually, one can understand. Yeah, the exercise we did later on, we tried to do the same for critical strings, uh, kind of. And one understands where this over prediction comes from, because roughly speaking, if you think about uh, linear energy trajectory states for critical strings, they're also obtained by acting by some number of oscillators on the ground state tachyon, right? So these degrees, these agreements, they will start appearing when you exhausted the operators which were acted on the ground state in strings theory. And so you kind of feel then by uh, kind of your uh, uh, kind of you're not getting new states and effective string theory doesn't know about that and that's why it over predicts states uh, but somehow yeah that's why i'm saying it's a bit of a surprise that open string uh prescription which uh as you say well it was somewhat ad hoc uh well first it definitely it agrees in the semi-classical region it agrees where uh things perturbative but also it really seems to, to agree with the with the actual spectrum which one finds uh, yes do you have the data for all of the all of the numbers that are shown in black? Like a, it seemed like you had there was some difficulty in, in identifying like which uh, I don't know. Uh, so, so, so before, yeah, so for instance, this level, yeah, that that corresponds to kind of this yellow states, right? So oh, okay, right. so this is this is n equals zero. This is n equal one. So this matches. So already for n equals three. Uh, so this spectrum would predict this should be yeah. odd spin states, J equal a one state, and there should be five scalars, and one finds three scalars. Right. So I think uh, just looking at that level, there is a clear preference for for this other answer. Uh, right. So that's uh, the answer. The question Clay is asking. That's exactly one of the things which we kind of appreciated on the after doing that calculation. Mm -hmm. That somehow it's. It's somewhat surprising that what we did before, but well, maybe somewhat. I don't know. Probably one can come up with a reason why it can make sense close to rigid trajectory because really it's the same calculation because we're doing classical calculation, so it's the same as a critical string theory. So it should work kind of in the regime where classical approximation is good. So I think that part probably is not surprising, but somehow it is surprising that uh, they taking this. Tensor square. And by the way, that procedure doesn't also work, give correct answer in for critical string. So if one tries to score, again to do this the same exercise at D equal 26, one doesn't get correct, correct uh, multiplicities. Uh, so somehow it seems to work for D equal three. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That's uh, that's the situation here. Uh, but anyway, so at least uh, as I pass forward, oh that still looks like a good starting point. So at least there is. For well, these states, which are shown in red, for those states, it definitely looks like one can proceed with the program, which I alluded to a couple of slides before. So one can use this closed effective string uh, and try to calculate the 
splittings between uh, the, the states perturbatively in, in, one, in one of the J expansion. That's kind of that's the, the work in progress. Uh, but I think there is something more interesting going on here that this initial answers by tensor squaring open strings seems to work, but so, so far it really seems to work for huge number of states. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, that's that's actually that's all that I had to say about 3D part of the story. I'll show now a few slides about 4D. Uh, but yeah, so if there are any more questions about that, that's uh, a good Okay, so similarly to 3D, in 4D, uh, the, well, that's where axiotic string, as that's 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 that name really requires its explanation. Uh, so it's inspired again by two observations. Uh, and I put them in the opposite order, like first experimental one and then kind of theoretical one. So the experimental observation is that uh, uh, if one looks at the lattice data in 4D, that actually there's a the reason evidence for uh, additional uh, massive state on the bullshit. Uh, and well, somewhat surprisingly at first, the, states, uh, is, the state is actually, it's a pseudo scalar state. Uh, so it's some kind of axiom, that's how we call it initially. Also it's naturally goes to topological number density, which is like string self-intersection number, which is in 4D, the topological density. Uh, but actually I think, well, the state and, uh, it's natural to think about it as a glue. So if you think about it, so if you think how the state, if, this, if you're a lattice person and think how the state are being created. So you have a long uh, Wilson line. So what you can do, like the elementary perturbations, which you can do, you can attach to a plaquette, plaquette, which goes like side, sideways. And that corresponds to shift, local shift of the Wilson line. That's a Goldstone mode. And that's more or less all what you can do in three dimensions. You can just do more and more of these plaquettes. But in four dimensions, you can also attach plaquette, which kind of in the transverse plane. So if the line goes here, then you can attach plaquette in the transfer direction. And that exactly has the right quantum numbers. And that's roughly the operator which produces this, this massive state. So, uh, so it, it really corresponds to kind of inserting additional glue on inside the string. Uh, and it's not protected by any symmetry. So it's, it's a massive, massive state now. Uh, and again, there is no sign of any, any other modes there. And at D equal four, so if you just take two massless bosons, then you take them both the action, and you try to do, uh, well, then that theory cannot be quantized as an integrable theory compatible with SO13 invariants. There is uh, one loop particle production, universal particle production, which is associated to the fact that we really work in non critical dimensions. So D equal three is somewhat special. But D equal four, there is a calculable source of particle production. However, if one considers the theory number got action plus a massless axiom, uh, then there is again a quantization of that theory compatible uh, with uh, with integrability, for integrable quantization of this theory compatible with a target space point carousing. And this again, TT bar deformation of that theory now is compatible. Uh, so somehow the unifying picture of both D equal three and D equal four, so the, the picture we have in mind when suggesting this answers that somehow theory wants to become integrable at high energies. Uh, and so uh, it's not literally integral. We see just from the fact that there is a mass of this particle, but uh, there is a chance that uh, maybe that's all particle content what, which is there. And can that one explanation for that is that theory wants to reach, reach this integrable UVS in totals. And there are some simple physical intuition why that might be the case. Make the light uh, Well, this is just again this is analog of the plot which I shown before. Uh, so these are uh, one particle like these are lowest line two particle excitations in four dimensions. So different colors here refer to different channels with respect to O2 symmetry because now you have a string there is O2 rotation symmetry around it, uh, and so different channels correspond to different scattering channels characterized by that symmetry. And in Nabucco series, the prediction would be that all the states would be degenerate in line of this dashed line. Uh, so these green lines here, these are tensors, these are scalars. So they're kind of close to that line, but uh, split it. But uh, this red line, uh, that's a pseudo scalar channel. And see that it's completely off of that line. And also it has a property that uh, the energy of the state is roughly independent of the uh, size of the string. So it does look like you just added a massive, massive particle 
on the wall sheet. So this is picture kind of illustrates then when there is a massive excitation on the wall sheet, you really see it with your eyes. Like you can do some PBA analysis and determine the mass, but it's roughly turns out to be that value. So you really see it with your eyes, those, those, those massive states. And that's what one finds in, in four dimensions. Uh, so it, it means the story can be that simple, uh, but so kind of what we did so far, we first we started with doing the same thing which worked in four in, in four dimensions. Let's let's ignore the axiom. Let's pretend we didn't know that. Let's try to take the Bugota, to take open strings, uh, perturbatively quantize around them, and tensor square. Uh, and then well, I show just first two levels. And for first two levels, one predict we predict uh, this uh, this content. So there's zero plus plus light as blue ball from following the same logic, and then uh, there is uh, this state at the first level. And now uh, let's compare. So there is 4D data. So this is the actual data which one finds for blue balls. So it looks, yeah, it looks like quite a bit of a mess compared to 3D. So uh, well, there is zero plus plus blue ball. Now I should admit it requires a bit of a stretch of imagination to kind of say what is the first. Uh, uh, the first uh, st string level is here, uh, but uh, well, at least these three states, they, these are exactly these three states. So at least in terms of quantum numbers, somehow there is no this tendency that if one really says that these guys are n equal one state, uh, then uh, uh, there is no tendency that a smaller j the energy becomes. Uh, smaller somehow it's another way around but also we don't know how it should be here uh, but anyway so given this kind of expectation it's natural to try to identify these three states with uh, n equal one state but then there is this additional state this uh, zero minus plus state uh, zero minus plus global and it's not there and it would also well, uh, and actually it turns out very hard to get it from tensor square and anything. So if you get it from tensor square, one really needs to add lots of additional stuff, which would lead to a huge proliferation of the number of states. But on the other hand, there is a very natural picture for what this state should be. Because if I I know that I have this on the long string, I know that I have the pseudoscalar particle. So if I have uh, one certain state, I can imagine just adding the pseudoscalar particle to that state on also for short strings. And that, if one starts from zero plus plus in terms of quantum numbers, that would exactly produce this state. So it's natural to associate this blue ball with zero plus plus blue ball, where on top of that, one adds uh, this uh, zero minus plus, um, is it both reduction and gets this additional state. And of course, well, it's a bit silly to do that at j equal to zero because it's, one cannot think about j equal zero blue ball as rotating string. But one can play this game at large j again. So, for instance, there is this state at j equal two. Uh, well, and one can again do perturbation theory at large j, and that's what we're getting now. So, kind of independently of what one thinks about kind of these uh, manipulations with ten 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 tensor squares here, and independently of what one you think about uh, how meaningful it is, one can still do closed effective string theory around leading rigid trajectory uh, and in the presence of um, this massive axiom, it would predict uh, that there should be a family of states and of, of this type. Uh, and knowing the mass of the uh, of the uh, axiom, one would predict also at large j. This one would predict the size size of this gap. Uh, well, and we're almost there. So we keep getting part uh, answer which differs. We keep like there is some factor of two uncertainty in the result of this calculation. We're isolating something which. But for, j, for this j equal two really sits on top of what we have or twice twice smaller but uh, so I don't know I would claim a success here but at least uh, in terms of well qualitatively there is a definite prediction here which should work at, at large j that at large j there should be a family of states associated with excitations when, when I just add this uh, uh, bullshit axiom on top <coughs> of the uh, classical uh, rotating rod solution uh, well, of course, it would be a very interesting question. So it is all pure glue. Uh, so to what extent it can be translated in actual QCD, but that's a separate story. Uh, but yeah, let me stop here. That's essentially that's where where we're now. So you have two linear trajectories, plug shape that 
Um, but it won't be, yeah, very naively one would say, yeah, so you have this long rotating string and you add a particle you just shifted by mass of a particle but it's more complicated than that because when you have this essentially you have rotating road solution now you add a massive excitation and there's a centrifugal force right so there is a effective potential for this mode which pushes it toward, toward the end point of, of the rotating road so kind of you might one get some potential like one need to solve some like again values like there's some material potential which one gets uh, so it's not just shifting it by mass so there is uh some calculation to be to be done and that's where and by getting this factor of two <laughs> things which i'm telling you about but the physics is a little bit more complicated because the string rotates so the centrifugal force shifts shifts this particle toward, 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 the, toward the end point and yeah. to what uh, to what each, which end there are two end well yeah so it will be kind of well, there is a effective potential, so it will be, yeah. So actually, that's very yeah. So one, one kind of expects there are two nearly degenerate states, right? And large limit kind of odd, odd and even one, right? Which would have different quantum numbers, right? Uh, so, uh, so actually, you see, that would be well at least here. That would be a whole. So yeah, if if this picture with levels being screwed up. Would be much more convincing if it turned out that these two states actually they don't belong to both of the states, don't belong to this uh, level structure, but uh, they can be understood like like this. Of course, then here we don't see anything like that, but this is j equals zero, so that's also quite singular. But yeah, indeed. So one really, yeah, I think well, we didn't work out all the details, but qualitatively it's clear what you're saying should be correct. If one should expect pairs of new, new degenerate states corresponding to uh, right because there are two two endpoints yeah so those are the, the classical almost classical calculations of symmetries well they're yeah they're lips so quantum corrections uh, may do two things uh, shift this uh, points yeah. but they do not change uh, uh, the aspects of representations in the high group right uh, or they can also add something which some other means but multiple of which are missing in classical case. Right. So I think well essentially good. So I think essentially I think kind of one precise way of saying what we mean by this theory being the equivalence class of number water is the statement is that is the assumption that all what quantum corrections do here they introduce mass splittings. But they're not introducing the new quantum new, new multiples. New, new, new multiples. So right. From the point of view of representation theory, right. you yeah. think it will remain as right. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of I think that's the most the sharpest way to formulate what we mean by the statement that this theory in the equivalence class of, of just number got Right. The point already is still nonlinearly realized in the theory. Well, this is scared talking about short strings. So here one carry is just well, oh, for, the, for the long strings. Right? Oh, for the long for the long strings, yes. Yeah. So for in, in, in D for four, that's yeah, that's a statement. So if one takes uh, uh, so one takes the number got action for dimensions and add this pseudo scalar mode coupled to uh, to self intersection number, uh, that theory well essentially quantizes that matter content by uh, using TT bar deformation. That theory has non-linearized form currency. So this is this is only when it's massive, right? Yeah, then when it, then then it's so, so in the latter state, you're saying a massive a massive state or the massive. Yeah, state. that's why theory cannot be integrable, right? Is it they cannot be integrable? You cannot realize uh, point array non-linear. You still expect some theory that realizes point array. Yeah, so yeah, some effective long string theory. Right, but it's cannot be integrable because there is calculable particle protection. So by the way, to maybe to connected to something which is more familiar to some people, right? So they, in, in this language, which I'm using here, kind of the canonical way of thinking about critical, the canonical pass to non-critical strings is adding, uh, adding the dilaton. So in this language, it's just a statement that at any number of dimensions, you can take the book water, add a massless scalar, and then there is a way to quantize that matter content Again, by taking the bar deformation of that full theory, preserving uh, preserving integrability, and that's exactly that's equivalent to linear dilaton background. So that's 
kind of in this integrability language, it looks like, well, kind of if one, if one accepts that what one wants to do, one wants to restore integrability, then there are two passes to do that, at least in four dimensions, at scalar or at pseudo scalar. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of, it looks like QCD strings, uh, they, they took this other pass, they didn't pseudo scalar and scalar. Uh, one thing that bothers me about uh, this whole story is that uh, so you're making some claims about say pure and mills in three dimensions in the large MC limit, like what string theory is equivalent to it. And um, all this talk about Nambugoto and H left and H right is like saying that that string theory is uh, more or less like critical strings. But uh, in our community, people think that there are important qualitative differences between like the string theories that are dual to say pure and mills and uh, critical strings. You know, we can talk about what those qualitative differences are, but I think you're familiar with them. So like, why is it, uh, why does it work? I mean, well, I don't think I it's actually, I would say that it's similar, but some aspects of that look similar to critical strings. But no, but this H left times H right business, like I thought, like well, I think that's really that's kind of that's more or less the definition of one-dimensional object with no massive excitation. Yes, but for example, it's not true for uh, I don't know ADS five crosses five with uh, Tooft coupling for the one. But, but because there are lots of well, first, that's not a theory. But it is a theory of. Uh, well, it's not a theory of strings in flat flat space, and it's not. Well, well it's dual to a gauge theory, like. The, the, but in the, that gauge theory, there are no strings, right? In that in that gauge theory, like that's that's a kind of formal. So you mean it's not, it's not confining? Right. Yeah. Oh, okay, but that's not. I I, I thought that, that's well. Okay, we can talk about it separately. But yeah. I just can't understand. It, it, this string theory is somehow the effective string theory of flux tubes. It's not the one. Those Feynman diagrams we should think of as some sort of discretization of a world sheet, right? These are two different string theories we're talking about. I'm trying to understand. No, it's the same string. Theory. Well, the string theory we should obtain. Yeah, so I should maybe started with it, but yes, I started too many talks with that explanation. But yeah, the way kind of to get this string theory, you do the form. You take confining theory with center symmetry, and you take strict total limit, right? You take take strict planar limit, and that strict planar limit. Uh, what happens if you consider now infinitely long string that uh, becomes separate sector of sub, 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 sub sector of a theory? Similar, like if the critical string can take JS to zero limit and you consider infinitely long string, that's a sub two dimensional unitary subsector of a theory. So you took that planar limit, which usually people say in a planar limit one gets free theory. Well, that's not true. It's free from the point of view of target space scattering, but still the Walsh's theory is not free. And actually, in d larger than three, uh, it's, it's non integrable. That's the reason why one of n expansion can never be solved in pure dual. Because even a strict planar limit, you are left with this object, which is two dimensional theory, which lives on the wall sheet, which is non integrable theory. So it's intrinsically non solvable object. Uh, but so, yeah, so that's what I mean by confining string. So that's, that's a theory which obtained from gauge theory by taking strict planar limit, but after I took strict, strict planar limit, now I can consider arbitrary energies. Now I can consider also energy to infinity limit because that sector decouples from the rest. So one should always, yeah, well, well I'm doing that order of limits. First, and c to infinity, that's, uh, and that's my definition of what I mean by Walsh theory. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then I can study that, that's, that's theory at, at arbitrary energies. And so I think there is, no doubts that that object exists. So, uh, and yeah, in that sense, my people often say that kind of QCT strings are less interesting than fundamental strings because they're effective theory, the effective, effective objects. They only exist at low energies. Well, that's not true. That's the argument which says that actually QCT strings, in some sense, are they even more interesting than uh, fundamental strings because, well, they they are not fundam they are fundamental objects in the sense that. One can still scatter things there at arbitrary high energies and things doesn't break. So in this limit, one does get 
uh, uh, fundamental to dimensional theory, but the theory is non integrable, unlike in critical strings. In critical strings, in just to zero limit, you just get the bar deformation of 24 massless bosons, so like in super strings, the bar deformation of some matter conflict. So, in that, in that language, QCD string is just way more interesting because uh, you perform this limit and you get non integrable, uh, really uh, quite non trivial dynamical system. But uh, I think my confusion was. was more basic than that, just that say in 40 Yang Mills, this is a theory of strings in four dimensions. Whereas if we were thinking something holographically, those are strings in five dimensions, right? Or, so, so I was just. This is David's same, same yeah. issue. David. But if there is confinement, then the string would be laying flat on the. But really, also, this says that. Okay, maybe that was what I was going to say. Right. But I think it really all this kind of indicates that. You see these strings from the point of view of holography, but at least they don't correspond, which is because well appreciated. They don't correspond to holography in where supergravity is a good approximation, right? Because if you have a string, well, at least if this story is kind of correct, right? Because uh, if you have super the gravitational approximation is, is good description, then you expect when you have a string, well, well if there's IR wall, it goes there, it gets stuck there, but you expect to find a mode. Which corresponds to Liouville mode, right? Which is the scalar excitation of a string, which corresponds to fluctuations of a string in the holographic direction. So that would be a scalar excitation on a string. Uh, instead, here, well, in three dimensions, there's just no sign of a mode like that. And in four dimensions, one finds a sign, well, it finds this pseudo scalar mode. And actually, it's very interesting because, well, I have a slide somewhere else, but I can't show it worse. Recently, there was a study using conformal, uh, using S matrix bootstrap, but by Pedro V. Ryan friends, and this series on the flux tube on the on the uh, uh, on the world shape of flux tubes. And what they found, they found well, this is usual in the bootstrap studies, there is kind of two allowed, like, there is a loud region, and there are kind of two two boundaries of that region. And if one goes to one of the boundary, then there, in addition to uh goldstone modes in four dimensions, one finds narrow scalar resonance. But if one goes on the other boundary, then one finds narrow pseudo-scalar resonance. And actually the coupling of that resonance, that's another coincidence, which I didn't mention that, but really in the numerology, that the coupling of this pseudo-scalar state, massive pseudo-scalar state, which we found in this model, actually it's leading coupling, it matches within error bars, within few percent, with the uh, coupling in, in the, well, exactly from lattice data, it matches within two percent uh, with the coupling predicted by integrability. And it also matches with the value which Pedro and friends extracted from S matrix bootstrap. So somehow that study really suggests that you know, there are two, also again, there are two regimes, natural regimes for flux tube series. One where you get uh, light dilaton like particle, and another when you get light, light pseudoscalar particle. Uh, and QCD strings seem to be living in, in that other regime. Which doesn't necessarily contradict holography. I think it's kind of the statement that holography should be really in the regime when ADS is so strongly curved uh, that you, you lose this scalar mode completely. And uh, it's probably even worse than that. I mean, there's a lot of wishful thinking going from the holographic picture of the strings that comes out of the say the SCFT to confining strings. I mean, there's all kinds of things that that, that change. Supersymmetry has gone away, all, all the magic has gone away. I don't know how much worship takes seriously that picture. Well, but, I mean, we, I don't think it teaches you anything about this. But then, by looking at that, but it could have taught them the, the quality of the first know. picture. There is some ADS region, and then there's IR wall, and string correspond kind of to the string which goes around IR wall and connect to quarks on the on the brain, right? So that picture makes sense. But I think that picture, the generic like zero zone expectation from that picture is that you look at the excitation on the long string, you expect to find the scalar, a massive scalar state, which correspond to uh, excitation in the uh, in the uh, radial direction, and that what indeed Pedro finds on one of the shores of this loud region through bootstrap, but just QCD seem to correspond to to a different uh, to, to a different uh, regime uh, where one finds this uh, light pseudo scalar particle in four dimension, and that, uh, as I originally said this. Like pseudo scalar particle, on that hand, it's very, very natural if you just think in terms of inserting plaquette in the string, right? It's just yeah, this elementary plaquette in the transverse direction. So that's really the 
the cartoon level, that's the first state which you expect to find. You indeed find it. All right, well, maybe we can continue the discussion offline and let's thank the speaker again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.